All right. Good day, everyone. It's now two o'clock, so I think we should get started with the call. From a home office here in Oslo, this is Mikkel from Carnegie speaking. In collaboration with Extra Investor and Corp Communication, I want to wish you all welcome to today's company presentation by Agilex. On the presenting end, we have the CEO, Tim Stedman, whom will take us through the latest and greatest on Agilex's end. After an initial introduction, we'll do a Q&A for the rest of the presentation time. I already have a list of questions sent in by listeners, but for those who may uh, have further questions during the presentation, they can either be posted in the chat uh, sent to Lars at Extra Investor, or you can send them directly to me at email uh, mn at carnegie.no. That's m for mouse, n for Norway, at carnegie.no. So with that, I'd like to hand the word over to you, Tim. The floor is yours. Okay, Miguel, thank you very much. And uh, welcome to this call from, from the company side. Uh, as Miguel mentioned, I'm uh, Tim Stedman. I'm coming to you from a home office in Switzerland. So we're all, all uh, dealing with this new world of uh, virtual working. Um, I'm joined today by uh, Russ uh, Main, who's our CFO. Uh, he'll be introducing himself shortly in a moment, but a couple of words about me. I've been in uh, Agilex now for just over two months. My background is uh, really exclusively in the chemical industry. So with uh, players who are today our customers. So when we talk about this whole area of uh, chemical recycling, I really understand that from the customer's perspective. Lastly, uh, before I joined uh, Agilex, I was with Trindio who is one of our major partners in the polystyrene chain. And before that, I was with ExxonMobil Chemical. So with that, um, Russ, do you want to introduce yourself and then we'll get on with the uh, presentation? Great. Good day, everyone. My name is Russ May. I am the CFO of Agilex. I am based in the U.S. on the East Coast, just outside of Boston in our office in New Hampshire. Um, I've been uh, with the company for just over six months. Uh, spent the majority of my career with Tyco International, a large uh, multinational conglomerate in various financial roles, and most recently was part of a startup company and uh, took that from its inception to its ultimate sale. And very happy to be part of the Agilex team and excited to uh, present to you today. Uh, thanks very much, Russ. So, um, Kate, if you could just move to page three. Um, we won't go through the rest of the board here. This presentation is available, so you can look at that. Um, but let's set the context. And a picture tells a thousand words in terms of the environment that we're in. Plastics has been phenomenally transformatory to uh, our existence as, uh, as the human species, if you like. It has given us so many positive things that have improved our quality of life. But whilst that has been developing, the reality, the simple reality, is that we've been ignoring this growing problem, which is now so evident in everything that we see, the problem of waste. And it has to be addressed. It is a pressing issue. It's an imminent issue. And we have to deal with it. The good news is we have a solution to allow the world to start dealing with this. We have a solution that works that can turn waste into a resource. So let's go to the next page, please, Kate, and, and talk about what is it that we're, we're really getting at. And you, you know, today, when you look at waste, um, obviously a lot, well, there are moves uh, to get it to be recycled, predominantly with mechanical recycling. And when you look globally, that, that gets you to about a 10% recycling rate. Um, and, the problem with mechanical recycling is that it has certain limitations. Um, it has to have a lot of pre-treatment on feed. You have to clean it. You have to grind it. You have to melt it. You can't deal with contamination. And so there are sort of fundamental limits as to how far you can go with mechanical recycling. And whilst it will remain an important part of the answer going forward, the way to actually move recycling rates from where they are today globally at 10% through up to the 90% the is through chemical recycling. 
And this chart basically talks about transforming the linear value chain that we're all used to into one that is cyclical, where you can take waste plastics, you can break it back down to its uh, constituent molecules and then rebuild it back into product that can at the very minimum do the same thing, the same job. And actually, in many cases, as we've proven, can actually do something that is of superior quality. We'll talk more about that later. If you could move on to the next page. Now, chemical recycling is something that lots of people talk about today. Um, and there's lots of different things that get included in that. People talk about it in the concept of plastics to fuels, um, but also uh, plastics to chemical intermediates, to things like naphtha. What I wanted to do here is talk about what is it that's unique or start talking about what's unique about the offering that Agilex has. So I've got, again, this similar you know, linear value chain. This time I've put in some example customers in here or, or brand owners, whatever you want to call them. And, you know, just to be reiterate my, in my introduction, you know, where I sat before from the customer's perspective was the one that's represented by INEOS. This is the producer. Uh, Tim? Tim, do you hear me? This is Mikkel. It appears as if the, the sound is missing. Does anyone else on the call hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Mikkel. Can you guys hear me now? Did you not hear me before? Now we hear you. You've been gone for about two minutes. <laughs> so uh, I apologize, everybody. I'm not sure what happened there. Um, where did you lose me? Or more importantly, where did I lose you? Right at the start of this slide. <laughs> OK, so my apologies. Let me start again. And thanks for sending the notes through. What this slide is about is really talking to our unique proposition, and we'll dig into this further through the presentation. It's built on two key principles. This concept of sophisticated feedstock management, and the second one is around the conversion technology. And it's really important to understand that it's both of those. Just having one is not enough. You need to be able to bring the right feedstock, which for most people they would view as waste, we view it as feedstock, to these processes to make them both environmentally sustainable and economically sustainable. We do that in, with a variety of different partners and pathways, but our concept is to take this linear value chain across the top with, with players who are desperate to get into circularity and to make circularity a reality but to work with them to actually enable that to happen. Because today they're struggling to join the dots between these elements in the value chain. And so we can do it for people who want to go on what we would call the plastics to plastics pathway. So taking a plastic product like a yogurt pot, decomposing it back to its ingredients, which in that case would be styrene monomer, so that you can then take it back to exactly the same yogurt pot. That's circularity. 
The second one in here, the customer is taking it to a chemical intermediate. And we can work with our customers to enable the, the infrastructure and the capabilities they've got to make circularity a reality. Let's go on to the next page and hopefully my sound will hold up. I talk about various pathways. The thing is our core technology is actually capable of working really to meet what the customer wants. So we can do on the left hand side what we call plastics to plastics. So that's going back to a discrete polymer. So polystyrene, it could be PET, it could be acrylic. And we can work with customers to deliver a completely circular pathway, direct circular pathway to those products. With other customers, we're working to produce a, an intermediate, so a NAPSA, which becomes a base stock, a, a feedstock in turn for their derivative units to produce polyethylene, polypropylene, those kind of plastics. And we also have the capability, and it's proven, to produce low carbon fuels. We've actually been doing that for many years back in the early part of last decade, working with various different customers to deliver qualified um, low sulfur fuel, jet fuels, uh, to various part parties. So our platform is highly flexible. Let's move on to the next page. We do this whole process or our business model is built around, as I said, one of enablement. We are a licensing company. We work with our partners through the development of projects. In the development phase, we're looking at, you know, how does our conversion technology fit with what they want? We do develop uh, feasibility studies. We start working on the feedstock management side of it. As you move forward into construction, we start, we obviously will give them a license. We also have uh, conversion equipment, core equipment that is central to the conversion process that we're offering. At the same time, we'll start getting into more detail on feedstock to match up recipes to optimize their performance going forward. And then again, we'll support them through the operations phases. And so it is an enablement asset light model that we have. We actually did an asset heavy model before, as I mentioned, that was something that we, we were working on earlier last decade. But this decision to move to asset light is because we believe that this is the pathway to accelerate growth very quickly and work with our partners to enable their strengths as part of this uh, passage of transformation. Kate, do you want to turn on to the next page? And so this is Russ. I'd like to highlight how we monetize the business model that Tim just highlighted. We believe we have a nice combination of one-time and recurring revenue streams during the life cycle of our conversion projects. And as Tim mentioned, it, it comes in three phases. The development phase, which takes approximately one to two years to complete. And that is where we do our feasibility studies and engineering work for the design of the facility. And you can expect revenues in that stage to be in between three and $5 million, depending on, uh, on any size plant. So it's, that's the range that we can expect uh, to generate revenues for, for any development project going forward. Once it goes into construction phase, that's when, as Tim mentioned, we obtain our license from our customers for the use of our technology, as well as um, ordering our core equipment that's uh, specific for our technology. And our revenue range for a 50 ton facility size ranges from seven to $11 million. And that's ratable based on that 50 ton facility. So if a customer wants a hundred ton facility, you would double that range. And once we go into operational phase, when the plant is up and running, that's when our recurring revenue streams start to kick in. And where that is, it's mainly royalty revenues coming from the offtake of the plant, as well as royalties associated with our supply of feedstock, as Tim mentioned, and also some uh, opportunities for uh, replacing spare parts and also offering consulting and management services to the plant over its 20 plus years of operation. So with that combination of one time and, and recurring revenue, we believe it's an attractive model, uh, especially as we start to bring more and more uh, operations online, 
uh, with our partners that we have a nice recurring revenue stream to help model out our business going forward. Okay, uh, thanks for us. So this slide is trying to capture the, the essence of our, uh, our value proposition as an investment. Um, it's built on these six principles. So we have a highly robust uh, and flexible conversion process, something that can deal with multiple pathways and a huge range of products coming in. We have developed that over 15 years. We've invested about $150 million in this. And through that process, we've developed a uh, strong patent suite to be able to protect that. But we've also developed a unique insight into the intersection between the chemical molecular makeup of plastic waste and conversion technology. And that's given us a unique data set which we're now leveraging with artificial intelligence to be able to optimize the pathways uh, to products, to what our customer wants, and to take cost out. That combination is what we think gives us our unique competitive advantage. But this isn't just a, a figment of our imagination or it's something that operates in the lab scale. This is actually something that's proven. It's running. As I said before, we've proven through years of running a plastics to fuel operation. And now we've proven through yeah, 18 months of running a plastics to plastics facility with our partner, America Styrenix, in um, the west coast of the US. This is certified as well with ISCC Plus as a circular pathway. And what we're looking at now is a huge market opportunity, an imminent one, one that's there right now, and one that needs technology that is ready to deploy. And that's where we're at. Next page, please. So let me just touch on this quickly. Um, we talked about this sophisticated feedstock, feedstock management. Feedstock um, or waste is extremely variable. It consists of a huge number of different products. Yes, there's a discrete number of plastics, but all kinds of different varieties underneath that, different additives. Uh, they can be contaminated with metal, soil, fertilizer, food, all kinds of things. And what we do is we take the fingerprint of that. And by understanding the fingerprint of that waste, of different waste streams, we're able to combine those together to optimize the recycling with the right way of running conversion units in order to derive the output that uh, our customers are looking for. So we've talked about plastic products, plastic intermediates, fuels. And some of the things that make that a reality is the way that our conversion technology works, that it's robust. Let's go on to the next page and talk about that a little bit more. So I mentioned that we've been developing this over 15 years. We've had seven technology re releases. We're now on our Gen 7, this continuous processing of plastics to plastics. As a result, we have collected a good patent estate to protect this. Um, and we have defined and worked with various different customers to qualify pathways from a crude, a synthetic crude, all the way through naphthas, through to plastics plastic monomers, so things like styrene or methyl methacrylate, which can go straight back to the plastic product um, that they would have been, have been decomposed from. One of the principal things that it's very important to understand about this technology is it is incredibly robust against contamination. And, you know, the thing that we are trying to do, the primary thing that we are after is to take unrecyclable, or very hard to recycle plastic waste, and with the absolute minimum of pretreatment to be able to process it. And so we're able to take things that are heavily contaminated with soil, with fertilizer, with food, um, with PVC, which is often a killer, um, into this process and actually derive high value products from it. One of the reasons for that is that we do not use a catalyst. Catalysts are very common in the chemical industry. They speed up reactions, they improve selectivity. So a catalytic system theoretically might have a better yield. The problem with it is that contamination kills the catalyst and catalysts are very, very expensive. 
What we're able to do is be able to deal with significant contamination and therefore we're able to feed into this process waste that others would not be able to deal with. As a, as a result of that, it's waste that's much, much more economic. And hence the comment regarding economic sustainability as well as environmental. Let's move on to the next page. This is a picture of the plant we've got in the West Coast that's actually operating today. Uh, this is a commercial operation operation with our with our um, with our uh, partner, America's Styrenics. And actually, if you go to the next page, it's actually in a joint venture. We've called it Regenex. Produces 10 tons uh, per day. That's its capacity. And I wanted to highlight this piece about feedstock, how important it is, because. We actually take feed from about 500 different sources. This can be curbside drop off. It can be agricultural waste, all kinds of different things. And as a result, we're able to get our feed for about one sixth of the price of what you would pay for normal recycling feed because we can take material that has no other home. Let's go to the next page. This combination of feedstock management technology combined with the conversion technology, highly flexible, highly robust, is the reason why we believe that we are uniquely positioned in this landscape. The dots here represent other companies. Uh, the little green uh, arrows represent truly circular pathways. Uh, we don't view plastics to fuel as a circular pathway. It may be valuable, it may be important, um, but it's not circular. And, you know, what you have here is a number of parties in the bottom, in the gray dots, who are doing things in conversion. And it's great. We want them to do that. We want them to be successful because we need to address this world problem. But what we're not seeing is the connection with feedstock management. Likewise, if you look at the dot in the top left hand corner, this is a typical waste management company. They can aggregate feed. They can pull it all together but they don't understand the connection to conversion technology and to downstream products. And that's what we bring. Let's flip on to the next page uh, quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but you know, we know, I'm sure you are all very well read about the drive to get this issue dealt with. You know, whether it's coming from European Commission, whether it's coming from brand owners, whether it's um, uh, companies making commitments, it's significant. And if we go on to the next page, let me just pick up very quickly uh, a couple of our partners, Ineos, Star Evolution, and Trinzio. So these guys are uh, the leaders in the polystyrene industry in Europe and North America. They represent 50% of that industry. They have made commitments to get to 30% recycled content by 2025 and carry on beyond that. If you do the maths on that, that's about 10 of our plants, 10 100 ton per day plants that you need in order to deliver that. Today, we're working on one uh, 100 ton per day plant with them in North America, and we're working on a 50 ton per day plant with them in Europe. And so there's an imminent need to move forward with this. Now, that looks big, but if you actually start looking at what the European Commission is pushing for, and you translate that back into the plants that we're talking about, then this initial situation around polystyrene is a drop in the ocean. And if you then take it back to the fact that actually Europe is a very, very small part of the global plastics industry, Asia is the big thing, then actually you can see that this market size is vast, absolutely vast. Let's go on to the next page. So we said that we work with partners. Our approach is to develop projects with partners. And here you can see a summary of some of the partnership activities we've had. We've got active products, uh, projects with America Styrenix, with INEOS, with Trinzio. We're developing new pathways with Lucite. We're expanding our capability with the technology company, Technic FMC, uh, but also with Worley. We talked about artificial intelligence in terms of bringing that to bear on optimizing that and we have work ongoing with GE to do that. So these are just some of the partners we're working with right now. Okay. And if we go we go to the next slide. 
Yeah, just I'm just getting a message saying maybe slow down because of the lag on the Facebook feed. So it should be okay now. Russ, go ahead. Okay, the next slide I'd like to highlight our current projects under development. If you look in the lower right hand quadrant, you'll see we have currently our operating facility in the US on the West Coast, as Tim mentioned. It's a real competitive advantage for us because we actually have proven out our technology and we have a plant running in the US. We currently have four projects, uh, as we mentioned before, in the development phase. Uh, the first project is located in uh, Japan, and it is a 10 ton per day facility that we're helping our partner to develop. We have two plants in the US under development. One is a 50 ton per day plant and another a 100 ton per day. And the fourth project is a 50 ton per day facility in Europe. So you can see it's truly a global uh, process and we're working with our partners worldwide to uh, accomplish our goals. Uh, and, and what this represents is about 210 tons of plastic per day being that will be processed once these projects are completed. What's of note also is we have proposals out for an additional 700 tons per day of processing capacity in the business development cycle with potential future partners. And from a longer term strong growth perspective, I'd like to kind of walk you through um, the capacity from a longer term perspective. You can see 2020 we just highlighted with our current pipeline, uh, but in 2021 we start to get an inflection point where we start to move these projects into the construction phase. And you can see here we've, we've estimated by the end of next year to have 210 tons of capacity going into the construction phase and bringing on some new projects to get us to 400 tons per day in development. And from a longer term and medium term perspective, we see uh, having about 500 tons per day of production uh, running throughout the world and then longer term about 1500 tons per day of operating capacity. OK, if you go to the next page. And this is just to summarize, you know, our strategy is to be the leading technology platform for plastics to plastics conversion, but supported by plastics to intermediates and plastics to fuel where that makes sense. That's our drive, because what we want to do is really address this plastics issue as far as we possibly can. We believe we have a solution to it, a proven one one that we've operated ourselves in the past, and now we're operating through our joint venture. And we have projects that allow us to scale this with multiple partners, with multiple pathways, and globally. And so we're gonna build out our organization, our platform, our presence, our capabilities to be able to work alongside our, our partners. Today, we've already got partners, uh, as Russ said, in North America, Europe, and Asia, and that list is growing. And that's what makes us very enthusiastic about the future, the potential impact we can have on this global plastic waste issue. So with that, let, let's pause um, and uh, switch to questions. And, and I just want to apologize at this point for some of the technical issues that have, have been plaguing us. Appreciate your patience. We have uh, more viewers now than at the beginning of the call, so, so obviously technology has not been a, uh, a disruptor for the, for the presentation. All right, thank you, Tim, and thank you, Russ. We have a long list of, uh, of questions here, so I will think I'll just kick in with uh, and start at the top, and we'll see how far we'll, we'll be able to get uh, in the list. Number one, uh, and this is uh, probably a more general one. It is stated that Agilex had plans for a listing in the U.S. market uh, years ago. Why did you choose to list at Merker Markets in Oslo now? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. It's one that uh, has come up in numerous places. I, I think it's it's very simple answer, though, which is, you know, we are a, a company that is focused on in the ESG space and um, the Nordic markets, Norway in particular, is one that really gets it. So when you look at investors who are looking for uh, ESG compliant uh, companies who are wanting to address these big world issues, 
then the Norwegian market is the place to go. The other thing is that one of our principal investors um, behind the company, Saffron Hills uh, Ventures, uh, their lead uh, individual is based in Oslo. So he knows the market, he understands it, and he felt as well that this was the right market for us to bring uh, this product to a broader investor base. And I think we've been proven right by what's happened. So we're very, very happy there, and uh, we think that this is a great place for us to be. All right. And speaking on, of Norway and the Mercury markets, there is uh, one additional company that resembles Agilex that's also listed, QuantaFuel. And um, not surprisingly, one listener has asked what differentiates Agilex from QuantaFuel? Yeah, you know, well, we don't we don't view QuantaFuel as a competitor because their offering is completely different. Um, and and we want, we absolutely want, and we all should want QuantaFuel to be successful because you know one technology, one approach is not going to be enough to address this issue. QuantaFuel, though, is uh, going down the path that we went down uh, back at the beginning of last decade. One which is uh, build, own, operate. Um, and they, uh, at that point, we were also really in the plastics to fuel arena. What we've done since then is pivot to, first of all, being a technology company. So we are a licensing company and um, enabling our partners to be able to move in the direction of a truly circular pathway. Circularity means taking a plastic back to a plastic. And so we are driving to that end, recognizing that with certain feedstock, with certain companies' custom capabilities, that there will be situations where you go to a plastic intermediate, a naphtha instead. But the way I look at it is that, you, you know, we are very much uh, in complementary spaces in this area. They're a build, own, operate company and we are a licensing company. And that exists in all parts of the chemical industry and the broader industrial landscape. All right. Uh, there is a, this is a more of a general and older one, but one from the audience says that refining plastics the way Agilex aimed to do was tested thoroughly more than 20 years ago. I cannot verify this. I'm reading a question from the audience, but, but it says that it never reached commercial success due to cost back then. What has changed in the past 20 years and how will profitability look like for Agilex on current technology? Yeah, well, we're not going to talk specifically about giving guidance on profitability, but let me give you a couple of pointers here. Um, the first one is that the world has completely changed in the last 20 years. You know, I come from the plastics industry. You don't even have to go back 20 years ago. If you go back five years, that industry was in total denial in terms of this being an issue and something that they needed to deal with. And they were not prepared to put their money and their capabilities where their mouth was around this. That's totally changed. So first of all, you have a value chain that is in a completely different state of mind and position. They cannot continue to operate in a linear profile, a linear way, and continue to generate waste with no answers. So I think that's number one. Number two, the regulators aren't going to allow them. You've already seen the regulators taking steps to actually push that. Number three, society isn't. I mean, it's fairly obvious that society will not put up with addressing it. So the, the, the landscape has changed. The second thing is that the technology has developed. Um, our capability here and our know-how around waste means that we can offer to our partners projects that actually meet the hurdle rates of return without, and I want to underscore that word, without government incentives, tax incentives, or assumptions regarding uplift on the product that will be produced. The key is the feedstock. The key is making sure that you can take waste that nobody else can deal with, that is distressed. But not just that, but that you can re-engineer through the feedstock management system that we offer that reverse supply chain with partners to be able to access it at the right cost in the right volume. 
The chemical industry, the commodity chemical industry has always, always lived or died on the basis of advantaged feed. If you have advantaged feed, then you can do all kinds of things. Look at the ethane that INEOS brings into Norway at the moment. Um, and what we're able to do with this process, we believe, we have seen, we have proof, actually is to give waste advantage feed to our customers. And that's what's critical. All right. Now that you are a, uh, a Norwegian company and listed in, in Norway and uh, your home market will basically be European, uh, how much business have you done with European companies so far? Yeah, um, well, right now, I think Russ mentioned the other day that two of those projects um, that are being developed are Europe uh, based. Um, there's an awful lot of other discussions going on at the, what I would say, at the pre-development stage. But what we're seeing is interest globally. You know, so um, we've got projects that are being discussed in various parts of the world. And uh, and so, you know, although, uh, you know, I'm based in Europe um, uh, and our, our, our kind of head company is now in Norway, um, the reality is this is a global opportunity and we can see things happening all over the world. And that's another reason why we believe that the technology licensing route is the right way of going, because we can enable projects in Mexico, in Australia, in South Africa. We can enable projects across Europe and Asia in a way that if we were building them out ourselves, we, we simply wouldn't be able to do. We wouldn't have the scale to do that. All right, we, we may come back to that. Um, next question here. There are many different types of plastics and you currently approached polystyrene as a starting point, uh, which is normally used in expanded styrofoam and ABS plastics, um, as you are probably aware of given <laughs> your location in, uh, in Switzerland. In the EU and Norway, PET is a larger market than PS, it is uh, claimed. Same percent, how much of the European plastic market is addressable with Agilex's technology? <laughs> Well, I could answer that very simply and say all of it, um, because all of it can be put through this technology. Um, but that would be a little bit overly simplistic because, you know, the PET, let's take PET as an example. There are reasonable mechanical recycling routes for PET, and that's great. Those should continue. They should be encouraged. And it would be ridiculous, quite frankly, to take PET of P waste PET of that quality and put it through this kind of unit. It's about making sure you take the right waste to the right conversion. That's what this is all about. So we will take PET and our plan is to be able to take the kind of uh, rubbish polyester, things that might go into, you know, downgraded Polyester PET, when it gets ground up in mechanical recycling, often ends up in carpets. Our plan will be to take the carpet and upcycle it to a water bottle. And so, you know, the, the, the fact is that these technologies hit different parts of the market. Why did we start with polystyrene? Very simple. Our customers wanted it to, wanted us to. Polystyrene was the market that was under pressure. It didn't have a recycling home. It was a it was a concern. Our customers was seeing a real threat before other customers with other polymer products, other plastics, were seeing the same pressure on them. So yeah, polystyrene was the first product that really got a pull from the market. That's why those projects are further ahead. But we now have PMMA coming through. We have PET. We have mixed waste plastics to intermediates. These are all things that our technology can address and will address in the coming years. All right. What do you see as the biggest challenges to overcome going forwards? Um, yeah, I think there's a couple of things that I would, would flag here. Um, the first one is if I talk about it from a business model point of view is it's the, the if you like the biggest, I'll, I'll position this as the biggest risk is, is obviously, you know, if you're building your own plants, theoretically, you have less risk. The reality is that your risk is completely different. You now have a capital risk, you have a commodity risk. We know because we've done that. 
in this model, you know, the the thing that we have to manage is the uh, the speed with which our customers move through projects. They're fully committed. They're wanting to drive this. I really, you know, we believe it's going to happen. We see so many, you know, opportunities to move forward. But that's, you know, that is the the thing that needs to be fixed. If it needs to be fixed. Needs to, you know, it's it's the reality. It's it's a it's a risk. You know, they could move a month. They could move a quarter. But we believe that that's coming through. The other challenge, I think, is around um, really uh, is is re engineering the waste feed the waste streams to become feed. And I say it's a challenge, but actually it's a huge opportunity because today there is so much material that is basically going to waste. It's costing money to get rid of it. And what we're able to do is offer the opportunity to take that and turn it back into a valuable product, a product that is equivalent to virgin material. So food grade material. I mean, can you imagine it? On the west coast of the US, what we do is we take old plant pots, old tree pots, things from the agricultural industry. It's rubbish polystyrene. It's got all kinds of contaminants in it you know, with metals, with soil, with fertilizer, and we can take that and process it back through our system to a food grade yogurt pod. That's what this is, this is about. And so if we can enable that waste system, then there is enormous opportunity. For sure. Um, <clears throat> All right, well, you mentioned the troubles of contamination, and uh, now you touched upon it again. So I'd like to take a, or ask of a real-life example. So say that you have a plastic bag, and that contains 60% yogurt pots that still has food stains in it. You have about, say, 20% pet bottles, and then 20% of mixed waste, which could be different plastics or, or whatever. What can you make out of that bag? Uh, what kind of yield would would you get in the case that you wanted to produce yogurt pots again? Uh, and what would uh, the eventual output of the process be worth? Yeah, well, it's, it's a complicated question. So let's start with the first thing. You could process all of that. And if you threw it all in together, what you would end up with is largely a chemical intermediate because the yogurt pot that they just mentioned was only a small percentage of the overall, and you're wanting to get styrene in order to produce polystyrene. So you'd end up with a chemical intermediate that you could then recover and use as feed to downstream chemical units. The point is you wouldn't do that, because what you actually need to do is you need to start looking at the value chain in a different way, and especially the waste value chain in a different way, to manage that to coordinate with partners to actually get the feed that you want. Now, the feed that you want doesn't necessarily mean nice, clean material. For example, if you end up with a bunch of yogurt pots, which is still half full of yogurt, that is not a problem. Organic contamination is not an issue at all. Um, if you're wanting to make a different product, you clearly need to manage your feed stream accordingly. So if you want a high yield polystyrene um, uh, stream, so a high yield styrene stream, then you are going to have to go to develop a feedstock that is predominantly polystyrene, but it doesn't need to be clean polystyrene. It can be contaminated with PVC, it can be contaminated with PET. But obviously, the more contamination that you put in there, you end up with a somewhat lower yield. But, and this is where yield becomes the real a kind of um, as we would say, red herring, because I can pay a lot of money for a very clean feed to get a very high yield, but economically, that may be the wrong answer. I might be better off taking a mixture of feedstock streams, some of which could be very low quality, in order to be able to drive my feedstock cost right down, such that I get the right optimal balance between feedstock cost and yield to give me the overall economic optimum. It's just like, um, you know, how you would operate a refinery. This is exactly what refineries do. But in this case, it's managing feedstock streams, waste streams with the conversion technology to optimize to the desired output. All right. So um, 
Speaking of the process, what is the electricity consumption on the technology? Say, how many kilowatt hours would be needed to depolymerize one ton of plastic? Um, I don't have the, the precise answer to that, and I very much doubt that Russ does either. Um, <laughs> unless you have that off the top of your head, Russ? No, unfortunately I don't. And, and it is very dependent on the output, what's coming through the plant and the size of the plant. And it, it's very variable based on, you know, uh, how, what types of uh, uh, heating units they're using and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's hard to pinpoint that to an exact kilowatt per ton, but um, we can look into getting more information on that uh, published for our investors. Yeah, maybe it's worth on, right. uh, adding, you know, one of the really interesting things about this technology, because it is, it's an electrical, electrically heated system, which allows us to dial in a very precise level of heat to manage the chemistry in the system. But what it does is, is you start developing, especially in places like Europe and, and maybe some parts of Asia, is it opens up the opportunity to actually um, do this using purely renewable electricity. So you can actually start linking this into the broader thrust towards the new economy, if you like. I no longer need to rely on um, sources of electricity that are not renewable in order to do this. All right. You started talking about cyclics and, and feedstock management, and I'd like to touch upon that again. If you could dive a bit more into the value that lies within that field as in where will you get the plastics and will you have to pay for it mostly or will you be able to get paid for taking it um well how dependent will a project be on on you being able to uh, to get get hold of feedstock and uh, eventually what kind of markups could you potentially pass on to clients on that feedstock Comes well, question in within one. It's, yes, it's multiple questions, and, and I'll, I'll try and deal with at least most of them. Um, if I don't do all of them, I apologize. But I think um, so. So let me start off with the, the concept. You know, what you have today is a um, a linear value chain where waste is being disposed of in a number of different areas. Historically, a lot of the, the, the waste that was viewed as being non-recyclable was, was wending its way to China. Uh, that's obviously all been stopped. And now people are trying to work out what to do with that material. Some of it gets burnt, but it's not actually a very good outcome, that, because when you start introducing oxygen in an in a incineration process, you've got a lot of uh, issues in, in terms of contamination. Um, some of it gets landfilled. Um, and what we're able to do is to map what we would call the waste shed around a unit. A first step of a, of a project like this is what we would call a feasibility study. And that goes very deep into the waste sheds that are available in the, in the local area. And we look at how do we, um, how do we optimize those as an initial first step to provide a platform for the volume that a, a given unit might require. So again, typically chemical industry thinks big is beautiful. That's the way they think. It's the wrong way of thinking. What you've got to do is you've got to scale the units at least initially to the waste sheds that are there because what you need is you need advantage feed. And so what we're able to do is talk to our customers about what the right geographies are, what the right waste sheds are to be able to optimize that. Now, what Cyclix does is it really takes that optimization. When we talked about our plant in the, the west coast of the US, that plant, as I said, deals with about 500 different sources of material. And Cyclix is about marrying up the cost and the molecular fingerprint of those waste sources to make sure that at the back end of our conversion unit, we have a consistent product. And that's the amazing thing. With 500 different sources, our product has always been on specification for our partner, American Styrenix. And that's the, the, the real trick, because if you can deal with a huge variety of sources from the relatively clean but expensive to the highly contaminated, 
but potentially at negative cost, again, that's before there's any government uh, incentive around those, then um, you have the opportunity to drive significant cost out and optimize your unit to deliver the best possible outcome for your customer. All right. I don't uh, think I covered all the sense. questions, but I'm so I apologize for that if I forgot something. No, I think you were <laughs> that that was pretty broad. But it, it's also been said earlier that Cyclex potentially down the road could land contracts on its own uh, on the sideline of Agilex. But if if so, could you ex exemplify what sort of contracts that could be? Because I mean, the, the intuition is that for what use will will free stock management be uh, if you if you're going to supply to to uh, competitors of yours? Well, there's two things I'd say there. You know, firstly, um, you know, the feedstock management business, which has been stood up under Joe Valancourt, who, you know, I took over from. So Cyclex is part of Agilex, is about creating an ecosystem in the feedstock arena and the know-how in the feedstock arena to drive cost out of that and drive up availability for our partners. Now our partners are obviously going to be, you know, an initial list is going to be the partners who buy our uh, conversion technology, but it may not be limited to that. So there is opportunity there. And, you know, that is going to be utilizing Agilex's technology because what Cyclix is using is Agilex's technology within the feedstock arena. It's Agilex's artificial intelligence capability within the feedstock arena. So it might be a slightly better way to think about it in terms of um, at this point is the way that we go to market is that in the conversion area where we talk to our customers, we're talking about an Agilex brand. When we're talking, but it's Agilex technology underneath it. When we're talking in the feedstock arena, our go to market area is called Cyclix, but it's still Agilex technology. So, you, you know, actually building out capability, building out volume, building out partners in both spaces is highly beneficial to Agilex. I hope that's clear. Very clear. All right. In the presentation, you gave some uh, ballpark revenue figures for the different phases of, of a project. Are those figures representative for the long-term uh, strategy of the company or are you now in the early days, call it, giving away margins on, on early projects? No, I'll, I'll answer that. That's, that is our expectation for the future as well. We're, we're not giving away any margin at this point in, in, in time. Those estimates are what we foresee in, in our current partners as well as future partners as we're negotiating proposals going forward. All right. So say in, uh, in 2025, I, I, I understand it, it may be difficult to, to throw out a potential revenue number, but I mean, if so, please do. But if not, please at least elaborate on how you believe that the revenue split will look like in terms of projects under development, royalties from projects under operations, and potential additional revenues from feedstock management on the side. Well, I, I think the best uh, estimate to give to this audience is, as you saw from our longer term outlook in our slide, we are looking at from a longer term perspective having about 1500 tons of capacity operating in, in around the world so that is the best uh, um, you know estimate we can give at this point and we are estimating in capacity at this point in time because that's what we believe is a, a good measure of of our business and how we're modeling out our business going forward and if you take that and the, and the uh, figures we gave you for the various stages you can kind of you know, estimate what what we believe will be the, uh, the the outlook going forward. Yeah, the other thing that I would say is, if you think about it, by the middle of this century, um, and I showed you some figures earlier regarding the number of plants that are required to really address the plastics waste issue. The reality is, we're still by the middle of this century. Um, you know, on the beginning of the growth phase of what needs to happen to address that plastics waste issue. Again, I mentioned Asia is multiples of Europe in terms of the, the, the issue. 
you know, 90% of the ocean waste comes from, you know, a handful of rivers in Asia. And, and so, you know, one of the things that, that you recognize is that this growth phase, this development phase of building out projects has a long way to go before you're anywhere close to really meaningfully changing that whole story. So I think that uh, don't don't expect that by 2025 that we're in that phase. All right. Um, the popped a question in the chat on the on Facebook here uh, regarding the the recently announced four-way NDA with Ineos, Trinco, and Amstai. Um, the, uh, the the announcement was a bit difficult to read. So if you could tell the audience here what it actually means. Uh, that would be great because it sounds like you're cooking up something big, according according to the the guy who asked the question. <laughs> yeah, I you know trying to get trying to get four companies to write an announcement together is always a challenge, and still have it mean something at the end. But let me give you a bit of a, a, a you know a, a kind of a, a simplified version of it. We have a significant project going on in uh, North America with. Amstai and with Ineos Star Illusion. Um, that is a 100 ton per day plant that we are, um, you know, is, is quite well developed through the, through the development phase. At the same time, there was uh, a separate agreement with Ineos and Trinzio to look at an Agilex plant 50 tons per day in France. And, you know, we clearly have very good relationships with those companies. But one of the challenges was because of the fact that they're different companies, even though Trinzio owns 50% of Amstai, there was this artificial wall between the projects that didn't allow them to share and to learn from each other. In addition to that, our operating plant, which we call Regenex in North America, is between us and America's Styrenix. And so the best way of thinking about that announcement was we were taking down the walls within the scope of chemical recycling of polystyrene to allow these projects to develop as fast as possible, to learn from each other, to get that, that sort of mutual benefit so that we would then be in the best possible position to address INEOS and Star Evolution, INEOS and Trinzio's objective of 30% recycled content by 2025 and Amstai's who just released it a couple of days ago or yesterday, their commitment to 25% recycled content in North America. And so this is about enabling again our partners to remove barriers for our partners to be able to develop those projects as fast as possible. Hopefully that makes more sense than the, than the announcement. And I apologize that the announcement was not clear. <laughs> it does, it does. Um, a question on the, uh, on the on the manufacturing. Once you reach construction stage on projects, who will manufacture the technology for you? Will you be doing anything yourself, or is Agilex just designing and drawing and then sending off to some uh, go call it manufacturing company that sort of puts everything together and, and, and assemblies? Or, or how would that work out? Um, do you going to cover that, Russ? Yeah, I can cover that. Um, we we do the design of all the equipment. It's all our proprietary design and, and protected uh, from uh, patent and research and on all the technology we've uh, you know put together over the last 15 years. We have a contract manufacturer that will manufacture that product for us. We don't manufacture the equipment, and and then we will then uh, ship and and help implement and install that into their uh, facility uh, once the equipment is fabricated and shipped to the site itself. All right. And speaking about construction phase, how far away are you from signing construction contracts on any of the pipeline projects? Um, I think, uh, you, you know, one of the things that um, was indicated on the page where it showed things moving into construction, um, that is, you know, expected in the second half of next year that we would move projects into construction. So that's kind of the, the thinking in terms of when you looked at, if, if you look back at that bar chart and it, you see that line going into construction, it's towards the back end of next year. All right. All right. 
Um, are there any other near-term triggers that we can anticipate? Um, <laughs> that's a tricky one. It's a very, diff <laughs> it's a very <laughs> difficult question because basically we're asking you to tell us something that you haven't told the Marcus before yeah. and that you yeah, probably yeah. shouldn't be telling here now. Yeah. <laughs> what I would say... I would, right, I let, let, I would... let me phrase it. I can, I can phrase the question differently. Yeah. What sort of news flow can we as shareholders expect during Q4 and 2021? How often, on what, and uh, of, yeah. Well, I, so first of all, we've already talked about the number of development projects. So I think we indicated that there was a number going into development over the next Next year, we will obviously have announcements as we pass uh, key gates with our with our partners. We will obviously have announcements as and when we uh, step up significant um, uh, events around uh, Cyclix and Agilex. And so, you know, our anticipation is that uh, we're going into a very, very exciting year. And the chart that we showed you is indicative of the fact that there's going to be a lot of activity. Um, the exact nature of that, the timing of those, the thing that I, I would say is we're going to announce stuff that is meaningful. Um, I, I don't want to bombard the market with stuff that is kind of doesn't really mean anything or doesn't move the needle. So, you know, and again, I want to, I want to highlight that you know, the, the companies that we're doing deals with and we're announcing around, these are really serious players in the chemical industry. They know their stuff. You know, you're not going to pull the wool over the likes of uh, Ineos and Amstai, uh, of, of Lucite and Mitsubishi. And so, you know, that's what we're targeting is to get announcements out as and when we do meaningful deals with serious players who have credibility in this industry. And, um, and we'll keep doing that. And, and I'm very excited about what 2021 and 22 and onwards are going to deliver. All right. You uh, raised a lot of capital just prior to the Mercury Market listing. What will be the use of proceeds for those? What should we anticipate in terms of cost spending onwards? Well, we typically gave uh, a figure before that our, our burn rate Next year would be about a million dollars um, a, a month, something like that. Uh, we were originally aiming for a, for a slightly somewhat lower number, a considerably lower number, actually. And the plan was for that to get us through this final development phase of the company. So we feel very comfortable about that. And into the inflection point that Russ mentioned, where our revenues will go up substantially as you move into construction. So we're very comfortable with that. And so now we're in the situation of having the luxury to look at how can we best deploy that capital to accelerate the growth. And so some of the things about doing, and we talked with those investors at that time, is developing more lab capability so that we can, we can actually work with more development partners. We've obviously taken steps to grow in Europe. I was the first European employee. I've now been joined by two more. We will be looking at growing our organization both uh, in Europe and in the rest of the world in order to be able to work more effectively with our partners. And we're going to build out some of the capability that is required to actually make us efficient. So whether that's related to you know, ERP systems, whether it's related to um, you know, the whole stepping up and working through of cyclics, these are some of the things that we're going to invest in. So it's going to be focused on accelerating growth. All right. Uh, I think that we're already now five minutes past three. So uh, I've, I've tried to come through all the questions and merge those who were uh, as similar as I, I could see them. I think we're going to leave it at that. And uh, thank you so much for, for taking the time and running through everything. If there is any last comments you'd like to make, any of you, I'd hand the word over to you and then I'll say thanks for, for now. Okay, well, I would just like to uh, appreciate everybody's um, attention and uh, the interaction with the questions. I mean, I really enjoyed that. Uh, apologies that it can't be face to face yet, but hopefully that'll happen sometime soon. And I hope that what you take away is that we have 
a unique solution, we believe, for this pressing world issue. We're very excited about it, as are our partners. And it's working with our partners that we believe that we can drive really substantial growth and really deliver on the start of addressing this big world issue. So thank you very much for your time and attention. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye, everyone.